So welcome to our latest CSL in session, Planting Seeds for Successful um, Focus Groups. My name is Christine Krieger, and I am the Professional Development Consultant for the Colorado State Library. Um, before we get started, I would just like to share a little bit of information about what CSL in session is. So normally you may be um, uh, having um, be, or be familiar with webinars where you're just kind of kicking back and listening for an hour, but we're going to shake things up just a little bit here um, for today's session and hopefully get a little bit of a discussion going via the chat as we go through today's session. Um, so the main way that you'll communicate today is using the chat, which is located in the lower left hand corner. Um, feel free to use the chat right now to introduce yourself. And um, then we have a couple polls for today. Um, also, if you are having any technical issues at all, you can get a hold of me using private chat in the upper left hand corner. I think I have a slide for that. I do. In the upper left hand corner where it says Colorado State, if you hover over that, you can send me a private chat and I can help you with technical difficulties. We are also recording today's session. Um, so uh, you can go back and listen to it at any time or if we can't get the technical issues resolved, you can listen to the archive. Oops. And we do also have closed captioning available for today's session. You can turn on the CC button in the top middle. You should be able to see that. Or if you prefer, we are also using a stream text option and I will post that link into the chat here also. And then you'll be able to um, access closed captioning as you need throughout the session. Um, so I think without further ado, I am going to introduce today's presenter. Today we have Sarah Weissen, who is the research assistant for the Library Research Services, and she's one of my colleagues at the Colorado State Library. So Sarah, I'm going to pull up your slides and turn it over to you. Thank you, Christine, and thank you to everyone who's here today. I'm happy to be here with you to talk virtually for a bit about focus groups. So my presentation is called Planting Seeds for Successful Focus Groups. Um, I tried to incorporate a little play on words here because as you can probably guess, a successful focus group needs to be a full focus group. So full of conversation. And then also, of course, it needs to have participants, which can be a challenge full of people to discuss. Recruiting participants and then getting them to open up in the focus group are two challenges that we'll be talking about today. So if you have any thoughts on these, um, as we go through the presentation, we'll incorporate some time later to hear from you as well. There will also be a few discussion opportunities in the chat in this session. And I just want to remind everyone to be respectful of each other's ideas in the chat and make sure you know that your participation throughout the session today is completely voluntary. All right, so before I get too much further ahead of myself, let's look at what we will be covering today. So the goals for this presentation today are three, these three points. First, we'll be discussing what focus groups are and how they can help your library engage community members. We'll also be looking at tools and tips for designing focus groups and gathering participants. And then thirdly, skills for conducting inclusive trauma-informed focus groups. Something that's not spelled out on this list, but I wanted to start with briefly is kind of the why of it, or why does any of what I'll be talking to about today like matter to you and your library? And the focus groups really can be useful because they're a tool that revolves around serving communities. And it's not our place to assume we completely understand the needs of the communities we are working with. Inviting people to share their input and taking the time to listen to community voices through a focus group is a great way to build trust and partnerships, two things that benefit both our community and our library. So before we dive into the content here today, and I promise that we'll get to what a focus group actually is here shortly, I just wanted to quickly gauge familiarity of uh, two focus groups of the participants to get a better sense of where you're at. Um, so Christine's going to put a quick poll up that asks, have you ever hosted a focus group for your library before? 
And if you wouldn't mind just selecting the answer that is the best fit for you on the screen. And again, if you're sitting there wondering, I would like to know more about what a focus group is, that's <laughs> completely okay. And we're about to get there as well. Um, on the other hand, if you have lots of experience with focus groups, we'd love from here to hear from you as well. Um, so feel free to put a short description of your experience in the chat if you have any. So it looks like we've got quite a bit of experience with focus groups. That's fantastic. I love that. Um, that's the 100% for multiple times. That's fantastic. And if you'd like to put a little bit of about your experience in the chat, that's great. If not, I completely understand. I'll give you a moment to type if you'd like, um, or we can just continue on here. And as I kind of give you a moment, I also can discuss a couple of the challenges of why we may not be able to conduct focus groups all the time. Sometimes there's limited time and resources, or it can kind of feel intimidating to recruit people to participate. And there's also lots of topics that sometimes may don't maybe don't feel as suitable for focus groups or just don't necess necessitate conducting a focus group. All right, if you're still putting your experience in the chat, that's completely fine, um, but we will definitely have time to come back to that as well at any point. And I'm gonna move on to the next slide here and go from there. All right, so before we move forward with more questions for you, I'm gonna lay a little groundwork. First, what is a focus group? Focus groups consist of several selected participants that partake in an intentional conversation directed by a moderator in order to gather community input. You conduct a focus group because you have identified an audience that you hope to gather information and perspectives from. And this is generally information that must be gathered through open-ended discussion questions, not simple yes or no answers. Also, the questions you pose in a focus group may not be something that your participants have already made up their mind completely about. A successful focus group often inspires creativity and idea development as it takes place as well. I think for me at first, the most common image that came to mind when I thought of a focus group was like people sitting in a circle, answering questions presented by a professional. But as we'll discuss, there really is quite a bit that goes into it in order to make the most of that time and get to that point. So what could a focus group look like in your library? Well, let's say, for example, you have decided you would like caregivers input in planning next year's summer children's programming. You may want to ask questions such as, what value has our library's summer children's programs provided in the past? Or what barriers may exist to enrolling in our library's summer children's programs? I picked these questions as examples because they could prompt deeper consideration and thought as the group discusses and don't, don't, don't necessarily have a right or wrong answer to go with them. I'll continue to use this example of a uh, focus group for caregivers discussing library, your library's summer children's programs as I move forward and dig into some deeper aspects of focus groups, such as recruiting participants and organizing your meeting and laying ground rules. So before we cover the topics that I just mentioned, I wanted to talk a bit more about planning your focus group first and specifically the importance of having a clear purpose as you begin planning. I have a background in environmental studies and research in ecology, so bear with me for just a second because I think of focus groups as fostering a symbiotic relationship between the library and the community. A symbiotic relationship is technically more of an ecological term referring to relationships between different species. Obviously, everyone's the same species here, but I just like this term because it encompasses how both parties of the relationship benefit from each other. Reciprocal relationship could also work, but symbiotic relationship is just the one I prefer because in the natural world, it often implies cohabitation and dependence on each other, which is exactly the situation we are looking at here. And in this situation, community members need the library and the library exists to serve the community. During a focus group, participants get to voice their input to the library and you gain knowledge and insight on what they value and can better cater your outreach efforts for them. That's a win-win situation for everybody. 
Focus groups can bring value to many types of projects, and in all cases, they help to bridge, the, bridge gaps between our library's data collection and outreach efforts. And by, what I mean by this is that focus groups can be a step towards what we call community-based participatory research, or CBPR. CBPR is a huge topic in and of itself, and I've made sure to include a link and some more information on this on the resource slide. But to quickly review, community-based participatory research means focusing on social, structure, structural, and physical environmental inequities through active involvement of community members, organizational representatives, and researchers in all aspects of the research process. Practicing community-based participatory research exists on one end of a continuum with community engagement being that first step on one end towards the goal of a full community-based participatory research where the participants are involved in every aspect of your research. But focus groups can still incorporate that community engagement into the beginning of your research instead of jumping into a project, assuming you know how best to complete it based on only you or your library coworkers and staff's perspectives. So what I'm saying by all of this and can basically be summed up by the second point on the slide, which is you can use fo focus groups to involve the community and foster collaboration. After that, the extent and purpose for which you use focus groups can really vary. For example, a series of focus groups may be the central data collection method for an evaluation. With focus groups as the main data collection method like this, you need to be prepared to conduct a thorough analysis of all that qualitative or story data that you're going to collect during a focus group or multiple focus groups. And this can really be a pretty time consuming process. On the other hand, you could also conduct a focus group at the beginning of a project to gain some community input in the planning stages. A common reason for conducting focus groups is if new services or programs are being implemented because this allows you to listen to people's and discuss people's viewpoints and thoughts on these new developments and then prevent unforeseen pitfalls in your planning before you're already too far along with the project. I've also seen focus groups used to prepare for a larger survey. Consulting the community you're going to survey helps then ensure that you're asking the right questions at this, on the survey and providing accurate and relevant answer options to gather the information that you're looking for, and then having that survey be able to yield valuable data. So those are some, in my opinion anyway, pretty good cases of why implementing focus groups can benefit you and your library. However, that does not mean that focus groups are the answer for every scenario. And of course, even if there were, even if they were, there's just going to be some situations where you don't have the time and resources to conduct focus groups. So here's a list of times when it doesn't necessarily make sense to conduct a focus group. First, if you're not able to incorporate any suggestions that you're going to that you receive in your focus group. And of course, this doesn't mean that you have to incorporate all the suggestions you receive. There can always be that one person in the group that's like, I think the answer is that you should remodel your entire library. And more often than not, you're going to have to be like, thank you for your input. But unfortunately, that's just not feasible at this time. Um, however, like we talked about, the purpose of a focus group is to gather community input and diverse perspectives. So. When we conduct a focus group, we want to make it worth both our and our participants' time. And even though we don't know what feedback we might receive, there should still be a direct focus that we know this feedback will be aimed at. And we should be planning to incorporate that information towards the end goal. For example, to go back to that example we talked about um, on one of the previous slides, you wouldn't necessarily plan a focus group with caregivers to talk about children's summer programs if you already have a plan for next summer laid out and you're just hoping that your feedback is going to support this plan, but you will probably continue with it regardless. That would just be a waste of everyone's time. Focus groups are meant to be investigative and not just to confirm existing assumptions, so don't use them just to check a box if you don't think you'll be able to directly apply what you learn. Next, 
Focus groups are not the best method of data collection if you're trying to apply your findings to a much larger population. Focus groups are probably going to be too small to consist of a statistically significant sample size for the population. They can give you great in-depth information, but unless you conduct many, it's not always a great idea to generalize the opinions of, say, a few participants to an entire population. Even if, in our example, you want to conduct a focus group for planning summer children's programming, you may want to conduct multiple in that case in order to feel a little more confident in your findings. In general, if you're looking for information to guide you on a completely transform transformative planning decision for your library, a focus group should not be your only data source, but it can still be a powerful tool when co combined with other data collection methods. Our next point here is that focus groups can be especially tricky if the topics you are discuss discussing are sensitive and very personal. You're gathering people together to discuss, which in many cases can inspire idea sharing, but in many other cases can also shut people down a little bit and limit what they're willing to share. Especially if you're talking about sensitive topics, that, that may be the case. This doesn't mean that any possibly controversial topic is off limits, but you should definitely consider if you think people are going to give you honest responses to what you're asking them in front of other people. If your questions make anybody uncomfortable, then you should probably reconsider conducting a focus group. Returning again to our example focus group, one of the potential questions I listed was, what barriers may exist to enrolling in your summer children's program? And this might be a sensitive topic, say for example, if a family doesn't have reliable transportation to your library, but understandably doesn't wanna speak up and have a full conversation about this in front of people that they don't know. Question wording can be important here then because it's a much more personal and possibly invasive question if you ask, what barriers do you experience to enrolling in your library summer children's program? You could maybe ask people to give general examples rather than speaking personally and just make sure that you're always providing a safe environment as you move into certain topics. And there's just always gonna be certain topics that regardless, it's better to study through something, say, an anonymous survey. Lastly, don't conduct focus groups if you don't have the time to do it right. It may be tempting to feel like a single focus group is a great way to save time rather than conducting five separate interviews, but focus groups also take a lot of planning to be well executed and should not be used in a rushed way to collect data. Along the same lines, focus groups require a pretty skilled moderator to lead an uh, entire group at once, and not having the right person available or then the time to learn the techniques of a good moderator be, could cause your focus group to be less effective and possibly waste the time of everybody involved. So that's four instances when focus groups may not be the right fit, and this is not necessarily a comprehensive list, so. Feel free to share if you have any other thoughts on this in the chat. All right, so we're gonna move into a little purpose brainstorming here. I've covered a lot of broad reasons that you could use a focus group and broad reasons that you may not use a focus group, but I'd like to also hear from a couple people. So. If my question here is, for what purpose would you host a focus group for your library? And I was hoping to get kind of creative here so I didn't provide any answer options for you. Um, so feel free to put anything in the chat. There's a whole lot of reasons that you could be conducting focus groups. And I wanted to propose this question earlier on in the presentation because as we go through our next slides, a lot of the answers to those questions are going to revolve around your purpose. You want to keep your purpose for your focus group central in who you recruit for your focus group and the question, creating the questions that you ask. So I see that one chat here says I recently used a focus group to gain details on continuing education. We use the focus group data, data to prep for a survey. That's perfect. And then in general, the reason I host them is to figure out how to provide services that 
the most patrons possible value. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I think that is a really great way to utilize them, to be able to talk to a group at once and discuss what their values are and then be able to adapt your services to that. That's perfect. So keep these scenarios in mind or the one scenario that really fits for you um, as we move forward with the rest of our planning and keep make sure that that purpose should be central as you recruit participants and create your questions and such. So we're gonna dive into our second goal for today, which is tools and tips for designing focus groups and gathering participants. And there really is a lot to unpack here. So gathering participants is possibly one of the most more challenging aspects of designing a successful focus group. And first you wanna be intentional about who you pull into your focus group. Since you're not necessarily trying to apply your findings to a large population, random selection is not necessarily the best way to go about this type of research. Instead, you wanna look for people who have a stake in what you're researching and valuable knowledge that you can't easily access yourself. To use our same example that we've been using throughout this, if conducting a focus group for changing up your children's summer reading program, a random selection of participants then might give you participants who are not caregivers or do not intend to utilize this program. Recruiting participants who have children of the age that you're hoping to engage would then give you obviously much more relevant information. Another piece of the puzzle that you should consider is the participants group dynamics, such as age, educational background, and socioeconomic status, among a ton of other factors. These factors can have a very large impact on who shares what during focus groups. And selecting participants that share at least some common ground can really increase the likelihood that conversation and ideas flow more naturally. This is kind of a push-pull relationship here because you also want to have diverse perspectives within your focus group and improve the conversation by hearing from lots of different uh, people and communities. So you may want to consider if you have diverging groups that you want input from, conducting multiple focus groups might be the answer to ensure that participants are comfortable speaking their mind within that group and then still hearing diverse perspectives um, through focus groups. Once you identify the group that you'd like to invite to participate, finding and contacting them is kind of your next challenge. One, the main suggestion I have for this is just consider using the resources and partnerships that already exist within and outside of your library to connect you to your preferred participants. Try to create a list of possible candidates larger than you think you might need and then plan for cancellations and no-shows because they'll likely happen. One way to build a candidate list could be to create an interest form for patrons to fill out that gauges their willingness to participate and also checks whether they're part of that target group that you're hoping to hear from. Then you probably want to distribute this list or this, not this list, the interest form on multiple platforms and then use your community partners to distribute that interest form as well. Keep in mind that putting out an open invitation for volunteers on say your library's website or just at your front desk or such is likely to recruit people who are already more engaged with library activities to begin with. And you may be hoping to hear from a group that's actually generally less engaged so that you can get them to be more engaged. Ask the people you seek out to participate by openly sharing the purpose of the focus group, the time commitment needed, and explaining the value that they can bring to the discussion. And all of this information leads us to another important question. How many people should you have at your focus group? Again, it depends a bit on the purpose of your focus group. You want to return to that, what are, what's the intended outcome there? But generally, I like to say to aim for between four to eight participants. There are certain other sectors like the business world that can definitely have a push to have even more people in the focus group. But for the purposes that libraries are usually trying to conduct focus groups, such as connecting to the community, 
building those relationships and gathering suggestions that are directly applicable to your work, it's usually good to keep it a little smaller. That way people are gonna feel more comfortable when they speak up and feel like they're heard when they speak up as well. You also just don't wanna set unrealistic expectations when it comes to how many people are going to show up. You could probably even still conduct the focus group if you have only like two or three participants. But in that case, you'd wanna make sure that your participants feel comfortable moving forward because it's gonna be more of a intimate conversation setting. It's also customary to thank your participants for their time and offer an incentive for their the time that they're spending to for you to hear from them. And funding for incentives can kind of be a challenge for libraries and a reason focus groups for libraries may be kept a little smaller as well. Incentives might include small gift cards or maybe being entered into a drawing to win a bit larger of a prize or even just having food and refreshments available during the focus group if it's in person. It doesn't have to be a lot, just something to say thank you and show that you realize that they're taking the time out of their, out of their day to show up for your library. Be sure to also be honest and direct with participants or possible participants from the moment that you're first asking them to participate about what that incentive is going to be. And then that being open, honest, and direct leads us to this last point, which is making sure your participants can give informed consent. I wanted to cover informed consent on this slide on recruiting participants because informed consent should definitely be a part of the entire recruitment process. You will talk even more, we'll talk about more of that, sorry, we'll talk more about this later on, but the more information you can give your possible participants about the commitment and the content of the focus group, the earlier, the better. People cannot give informed consent to participate if they have not been given details about what they'll be asked to do. So from the very start, try to be thinking about how you'll ensure your participants have enough information to be able to agree if you ask them to participate in this study. Simply asking everyone if they're in agreement once you've already gathered them for the focus group and laid out the ground rules and are about to begin doesn't really give people a great option to opt out very easily. All right, so like I mentioned, even though your participants should already have a good idea of what they agree to and given consent to participate during the recruitment process, you should still review that information and lay the ground rules once everyone's gathered together. When beginning a focus group, make sure that you give a welcome and introduction so everyone feels acknowledged and of course knows that they're in the right place. And it's important to be on top of your demeanor from the very moment that people start to show up. Your enthusiasm and attitude as the leader in that situation can really set the tone for your participants and how comfortable they are throughout the rest of the focus group. You wanna make sure that you introduce yourself and then also make sure that you introduce coworkers who are with you. I would strongly recommend, it can be super helpful to have a note taker along with you who does not participate in the discussion but if you don't introduce that person and what they're in do doing and why they're there, just having them sit kind of quietly in the corner taking notes can feel pretty intimidating to participants as they know they're being observed in their discussion. After introductions, then you still wanna cover some important points. You still wanna give an overview of what the focus group is for and then the topics that are gonna be covered and then set some rules for participants. Some things you might want to include in those rules include asking participants to be direct in their response or asking participants to direct their responses to your questions to the entire group, but not just back to you. It can be easy for participants to want to just speak to whoever asked the question, but a lot of times focus groups will be more successful if there's a discussion between different participants. So having them look around the room as they answer can kind of get that discussion flowing. And then of course, you always wanna make sure that it's necessary for everyone to speak, listen, and act respectfully throughout the entire time. 
It may help to give some examples of what this looks like, such as only one person talks at a time, don't talk over each other, and address what was said instead of just like abruptly changing the subject and kind of dismissing somebody's response. Most of these rules are just what you'd want to lay down as reminders to act like respectful, decent human beings. But they still definitely need to be said out loud because they should be at the forefront of everyone's mind as they're going into the discussion. And everyone should be aware that any disrespect won't be tolerated in that situation. All right, so I have another poll here. I know that was a lot of information at once, so I wanted to break it up a little bit. This is just asking for feedback from the participants again. After going over this information, do you still have plans to host a focus group for your library in the future? And don't, don't feel bad about making my, my feelings hurt, whatever the response is. I completely understand there's certain challenges, but it sounds like we've got a yes, so that, that's fantastic. Thanks for participating. All right, I think we can kind of move on here. I'm glad to hear that some of this will be incorporated in the future. That makes me pretty happy. Um, we're gonna look now at cultivating your questions, which kind of goes along with this theme of planting seeds here and gardening. Um, not only do you want your focus group to be full of those participants, like I said at the very beginning, but you also want the discussions to be full of relevant information. So that means that you always wanna keep your purpose in mind, the purpose of your project in mind, and the participants that you are working with in mind as you're creating the questions. Those should really kind of grow your questions between considering your purpose and then who you're asking these questions of kind of naturally flow into what would make sense to ask here. Each question should be directly tied to the information that you're seeking, in other words. How you structure and word your questions is really one of the most important pieces of running a successful focus group. Participants will be more comfortable if the questions asked are clearly worded, they don't have any confusing, confusing library jargon, I know there's a lot of that out there, and don't ask questions that make participants obviously feel guilty or embarrassed, that's just going to shut down. Not only is that just terrible practice, but it, you're not going to get very relevant information or honest answers, and yeah, worse Case scenario people leave feeling uncomfortable and you've that's just not a situation anybody wants focus groups are your chance to ask open-ended questions that spark lengthy responses and discussion but that doesn't mean that you should over complicate the complicate the questions themselves at all in fact you should probably try to keep the questions pretty short because if you have multiple parts to one question half the question may be overlooked or worse than lead to confusion, misunderstanding. One person answers one part of the question, one person answers the other part of the question, and suddenly we're having two different conversations at once. It's just better to keep the questions themselves short, even though the topics that they're covering can be pretty complex. Keep an open mind and don't try to predict how participants will answer your questions. And of course, questions should not be leading participants towards a specific answer. In other words, you don't wanna go into creating your questions thinking, oh, if I ask this question, people are likely to have a positive uh, response to that because you don't know and you don't wanna be guessing and you want to hear honest responses, not what your question's leading them to suggest. If your first focus group has a couple questions that people seem kind of reluctant to answer. Just try to make sure to put yourself in the participants' shoes moving forward, learn from your mistakes and rework your questions for next time. I wouldn't think, oh, the next group, they'll answer those questions. No, I would seriously take into consideration why an entire group was kind of quiet towards that question. It may have been confusing. Um, there's a lot of reasons, but it's worth reworking your questions to try to make sure that they're as engaging as possible for the group. Also, you wanna ask follow-up questions such as, can you explain what you mean by that? Can you tell me why you feel that way? 
Um, this can be really helpful down the road because the last thing that you want to be doing after conducting your focus groups is trying to interpret vague answers or guessing what somebody was trying to say through a recording. That's just not good practice. And along the same lines, you want to make the most of your participants' time. I would suggest having both a note taker and recording the focus group. Of course, if you're recording the focus group, that's something that your participants should be aware of and informed and agreed to ahead of time. If you're feeling especially creative, you can definitely move away from like traditional interview question structure during a focus group and ask participants to rate different experiences. You could even do a, something where they draw a picture of what they're, what they're imagining or take a quiet moment to reflect and then share their thoughts that way. Um, that can be helpful to, for people that want a little more time to digest the question before answering right away. If you just have everyone think and then go through and answer questions after you've given the group time to consider. You wanna be a little cautious with any kind of creativity activities you throw into here because you don't wanna do something just because it sounds fun if it doesn't directly relate to your intended outcomes. Again, that goes back to being conscious of the fact that your participants are spending their valuable time to be there. And then you also wanna make sure that you can maintain control of the space as people get creative and it doesn't yeah, run off topic or get out of hand that way. All right, so now we're gonna move into our third learning objective for today, which is skills for conducting inclusive trauma-informed focus groups. And I was gonna change this up here a little bit and start with the discussion first and ask, how do you think you can ensure your participants feel comfortable during your focus group? You can place your suggestions in the chat if you have any. Um, there's a ton of possible answers, so feel free to share whatever comes to mind. And I will give just a few moments here for some thought, and then we'll go from there and see what we come up with. All right, so I see communicating in a way that is sensitive to their needs or experiences. Yes, that that encompasses a basically, yeah, a whole main point of it. That's perfect. Um, that includes like not using jargon that they don't understand, that trauma-informed approach that we're gonna kind of come back to earlier, making sure that we're not being insensitive. Exactly. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Here are a few suggestions that I came up with. A lot of this kind of falls under that being sensitive um, to their needs and experiences as well. So that's great, but I'll go through a few here and kind of explain them as I go along because I kept them short. So I wanna make sure that um, you're understanding what's on the slide as well. So first I had demonstrate verbal and nonverbal listening cues. Uh, that could be maintaining eye contact, having an intensive attentive posture, not being distracted, smiling even. That was that's a huge one. I wish I just would have put that on here as a bullet point, but not looking disapproving, having that having a friendly, having a friendly smile. And then I had ask for clarification before assuming what someone means. We discussed a little bit about that earlier as well. You don't wanna interpret their information wrong in a way that overlooks what they're trying to say. Be flexible if important unanticipated points arise. Uh, it can be easy to be thrown off if someone suggests an idea that maybe initially you think, oh, that takes too much time and you don't want to you want to pull it back on topic, but as long as they're answering your questions in a respectful manner, 
then it maybe makes sense to kind of dig into that more, even if it's not, again, what you expected the participant to answer. Um, you want to make an example by being confident. If you seem hesitant and unsure of what's going on, your participants likely will feel that way as well. And it's important to kind of maintain that confidence and lead the discussion in that way. Generally, you want to stay neutral. I could see being encouraging to participants' answers, but you don't want to agree strongly or disagree strongly in a way that makes other participants feel like they can't speak up with kind of like respectfully challenging points there as well. And that leads to the next thing. You want to be challenging or respectful of differing opinions. You know that not everybody might be on the exact same page and that's completely okay. But you want to, as, as the moderator of the focus group, it's not your job to decide if one answer is right and one answer is wrong. You're there to listen. You want to give everyone an equal chance to share. Some people are going to just generally share more than others. That's okay, but make sure that everyone feels like they have the chance to jump in. Avoid leading questions. We talked about this a little bit earlier as well. Uh, not asking a question that's going to make people feel like a certain answer is expected. And then steer the conversation back on topic if it goes astray. And by this, I mean, if the discussion is no longer relating to the questions, that can make people uncomfortable because it can easily go down a path that people didn't agree to participate in the conversation that wasn't related to what the topic is on. So you want to make sure that you kind of rein it back in and be respectful of people's time that way. All right, we're going to move on to a few challenges. And as we kind of, we want to keep those suggestions in mind as we talk about these challenges, because a lot of them are directly related and how you'll respond to challenges and focus groups. The main suggestion I have for dealing with challenges is to make sure that you're practicing these skills and thinking through how you'll react to potential problems. And by these skills, I mean kind of the listening skills that we just talked about, which are luckily not necessarily just applicable in focus groups, but actually applicable in most work and social environments. So you've got a ton of opportunities to be practicing these skills to create a comfortable, safe sharing space um, throughout work. And a lot of, they're so applicable to so many aspects between leading meetings and just many different scenarios. So the more you practice them, the more you'll be prepared when challenges arise in your focus group. A few factors that might make moderating your focus group a little more challenging include experts or dominant talkers, shy participants, people that kind of want to ramble and get off track, and your response will be a little different for each of these. For dominant talkers, for example, you might just have to respectfully say, thank you for sharing, we really appreciate your input, but let's see if we can hear from others on the, um, in the group on this topic now. Or for shy participants, you may have to make sure that you have patience before moving on too quickly. I know for me personally, um, sometimes I just need some time to think before I feel comfortable answering and opening up a little bit. You also may need to reword a question or provide a couple prompts or follow-up questions to get people talking. On the other hand, there's maybe people who tend to get a little off topic and then need some gentle reminders to stay on topic so that others in the group can share their answers to the questions as well. One of the things that I found most challenging in group work is the group think challenge. Group think occurs when everyone in a group wants to be agreeable and people are not really not willing to respectfully challenge each other at all. Like there's not a challenge there or opposing viewpoints kind of even brought up, which can lead to the whole group coming to a conclusion that in hindsight might kind of have a lot of gaps and not be very thought through. To combat groupthink, you need to be able to 
bring up points or play devil's advocate sometimes when appropriate. This is in no way a comprehensive list of challenges. I'm sure that more things could happen. More challenges could come up in focus groups than I could possibly imagine. But the point isn't to discuss each one in detail, but make sure that you're aware of what might happen. And so when you do find yourself in a situation, you don't react, you have practiced like the respectful way to kind of bring things back on topic or ask for viewpoints from others in the group and such. All right. So finally, we even touched on this a little bit earlier in creating a safe sharing space, but you want to make sure you remember that you do not always know the traumas individuals or communities you are working with may have faced. So approach focus groups with a trauma informed lens. Your goal always is to limit any risk to your participants during the focus group. And you want to start this, you can start this by making sure that your physical, the physical space that you are in is uh, something that's welcoming and safe for people. You want to earn the trust of your participants by being transparent and clear in all your interactions with them. And you want to have empathy for others' past experiences that may be causing trauma. Learning best pra practices for a trauma-informed approach is really important. I put in our, a resource on our final resource slide with more information on this. And mainly a trauma-informed lens, working through a trauma-informed lens does mean more than just practicing those communication skills we talked earlier, but also taking that a step further to provide a space kind of kind of a space of understanding and connection if needed. If you're going to move into some more personal questions during a focus group, you may want to pause beforehand and reiterate that partic participation is completely voluntary and anyone can leave at any time. You should also know where to direct people to be able to provide additional resources if someone is looking for help that you cannot provide. All right, so that concludes the information that I had to share with you. I just wanted to wrap up by opening the floor up to anyone who wanted to share about certain experiences that they've had with focus groups. If you've participated in a focus group before, library related or not, I think that would be fascinating to hear about. You could also share whether um, you had answers to any questions before that you didn't get to share in the chat. And yeah, I'd love to hear more about what you hope to use focus groups for in the future. I can also open it up now if you have any questions for me as well. And I see in the chat here, sometimes incentives aren't enough. Hiring a market research firm really helps with success. Um, I completely agree. It can be hard. Incentives don't always get people to show up like you'd like. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. And if you've worked with anybody that's been very helpful, um, yeah, I agree. Getting that professional outside help can be can make a big difference. Yeah, people not showing up, even with gift cards and drawings. Yeah, I wish I had a few more suggestions on that. I'm definitely going to try to look into it. I know that's one of the largest challenges is just, yeah, having people show up when they're, it's a voluntary thing and people get busy. Everyone's got a life going on. It's crazy. 
provided food after hiring the firm, gift cards and drawings and did pretty well. That That's great. That's definitely something that I might, yeah, thank you for sharing because I might add that in, in the future, knowing that that can make such a big difference. Thank and you. This is Christine. I'm thinking back to um, a couple of things that you mentioned at the beginning of the session, Sarah, um, which is in addition to kind of where libraries normally market stuff is um, trying to find some community partners or community leaders that you might also be able to kind of share the information out with. Um, uh, those people may kind of know who to tap in the community or um, be, may be able to provide some um, more directed invitations to participate than the library perhaps can, and that might help increase attendance as well. Definitely. Yeah, I think that you might have a partner with your library that can reach people a little bit more or people are more engaged with than specifically the library and they might kind of through that avenue then be happy to jump in there, share their time and participate by utilizing, yeah, those partnerships that exist. Thank you, Christine. Any other last minute thoughts on focus groups and things that you guys have experienced or any other questions for Sarah before we wrap up for today? And I know Sarah mentioned she has this list of resources. Um, I will add these, um, the slides and the resources um, on the Libraries Learn website. Um, should be there later this afternoon. So you'll have access to um, the recording and the slides and the resources. But if there are no more questions for Sarah, um, feel free to pop them in chat if you think of something. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap us up for today. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for attending this session. Um, we know that your time is valuable also, so we appreciate you um, attending. And I do have a survey. You can either click on the link in on the slide or I've posted it in chat. I'm also going to type my email address into chat in case um, anybody needs a certificate for attending today. And bear with me, I can't type and talk at the same time. And I also just wanted to say quickly, um, thank you. Thank you to everyone uh, here and thanks to Christine for setting this up. Yes, I, I want to uh, extend a great thank you to Sarah for agreeing to do this CSL in session with me today. I think she sounds some really comprehensive information about focus groups um, and um, uh, something that people can kind of go back and revisit um, when you are ready to do focus groups. So thanks again to Sarah for providing that. Um, and then our last, or, um, I want to say our next CSL in session is going to be on Wednesday, December 14th, when we are going to discuss creating jargon-free libraries. So we talked a little bit about um, having jargon-free focus groups, um, but we're going to talk about how to reduce the use of jargon in libraries in general on December 14th. So once again, thank you to those for attending today. You can see the um, URL for libraries learn on the slide and if i can grab the right mouse i will also pop that into chat so you'll know where to go to um, get the archive information later this afternoon um, and once again uh, thank you to sarah for providing the information i thank you to our captioner for today and i hope everybody has a really great afternoon thanks for joining us today